Welcome to church today. We're so glad you're here. We're in this series called Summer at Purpose where we're talking about theology for the everyday person. The reason we're talking about theology is because the study of God and ultimately what you think about God determines your actions. Okay, so what you believe determines what you're going to do. Last week we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, the title of today's message is The Church the World Needs. The church the world needs. One of the things that Jesus prayed at the end of uh, his life on earth where, before he ascended into heaven was for unity within the church. In fact, he prayed that we all would be unified. And, and it can be easy to be unified with people who look like you, who talk like you, act like you, root for the same sports team as you. It's more challenging to be unified with people who don't look like you or talk like you or act like you or, or believe the same things that you believe. Now, what's interesting is that when you read scripture, Jesus talks about how important unity is. And one of the amazing things about the church is that when you're changed by Jesus, like Jesus radically changes your life. You change the way you behave. You change the way you act. It's not out of willpower. In, in some ways, it's natural through the power of the Holy Spirit where people inside of the church, you begin treating them like your family because they are family because you have a spiritual bond together. Then people who are outside of the church, you treat them better even if they don't treat you well because of the love of Jesus has changed your heart. And if Jesus could save you when you've sinned, you can love other people even when they sin against you. It's easier said than done. Today, uh, we're going to talk about this bottom line. It comes from a pastor named Tim Keller, and here's what it says. Uh, it's the gospel creates a supernatural community through spiritual heart surgery that plays itself out in the world. Okay, the reason you can know Pastor Tim Keller that comes from him is because I don't talk like that at all. Okay, that's like way too many big words for me. Um, but this series is largely based off a lot of his work and some of the sermons that I learned from him. And uh, today, if you got a Bible, you can open up to Ch Ephesians chapter 2. And if you don't bring a Bible, I'd encourage you next week, bring a Bible when you come to church. And uh, if you got your phone, you can take out your YouVersion app. Um, God's Word is so powerful. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, Ephesians chapter 2 today. But before that, I want to give a little bit of context um, to Ephesians. So Ephesians was a book written by Paul. And when I say a book, it was actually really a letter written to a church that he planted. And when Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, he's giving multiple metaphors and images of what the church is supposed to be, what the church is called to be. And here's the first one that he talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, 15 or Ephesians chapter two, verse 19. He says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. So what is Paul doing here? First of all, he's saying, hey, just in the same way that you are an American citizen, or you are the citizen of like a city like Goodyear or Buckeye, wherever you're at, the most important thing about you is not that you're an American citizen, although that's great. I love being American. The most important thing about you is that you are a citizen of heaven. That's what it says in Philippians. You are a heavenly citizen. The verse continues on, and he says, um, but with fellow citizens, with God's people, and also members of his household. So when Paul's writing this, he's saying, okay, you're, you're not only a heavenly citizen within um, the church, and ultimately you're going to go to heaven one day, which is great, and you're a citizen of that. You are also a member of God's household. You are part of the family. So I want to take a moment. You may have grew up in a really bad family. Like you may have grown up in a terrible family. Can I just encourage you? When you make a decision to follow Jesus, you are part of God's family. Like, how great is it? You are part of God's family. Like, your family growing up, it may have been so dysfunctional. It may have looked like the Kardashians were, like, normal, okay? But your family, when you're part of God's family, it, things change. You're part of the greatest family that you could ever be a part of. And God is the heavenly father. And everybody around here has made a decision to follow Jesus. They are your spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. But it doesn't stop there because the verse continues. It says, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him who the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So the church, it's built on Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. The visual that he's giving here is that we are coming together to build a temple. In the Old Testament, the temple was built 
And that is where the presence of God manifested itself. So when you look at these metaphors, think about it. In verse 19, he starts here. Verse 21, he continues on. And the way that uh, Paul is writing this is he's showing um, essentially an intensity of the relationship with God through which we see. Because it starts off saying, hey, you're a citizen of God's land in a way. Now, you can be a citizen of something and you can live in the same city as a king or a president, but that doesn't ever mean you're going to see the king. It doesn't mean you're ever going to see the president just because you live in the same city as someone doesn't mean you're going to see those people, but it gets a little bit more intense, right? He says, you're a member of that household. So you're not just a heavenly citizen. You are part of God's household. Then it gets even further, even more intense. It says you are building the temple of God. He's saying that the Holy Spirit lives and dwells in you. You see this? Okay, so city, right? Family gets even closer. Oh, now the Holy Spirit actually lives and dwells inside of you when you make a decision to follow Jesus. It's getting more relationally intense. And it's not just more relational with God. It's also more relational with God's people. Because you're not just in the same city with people who make a decision to follow Jesus. It says you're part of their family. And then in scripture, it says you're living stones, which means you're cemented together to build God's temple, to build God's house. That if you're a follower of Jesus, we are coming together and we are banded together to build the house of God right here and today. So so we build relationships with each other. And here's what's amazing about this is that this means the church becomes the most diverse, crazy place in the world where people come together. Let me give you an example. I led a group at my last church. And if you walked into this group when we were hanging out at Panera, you would look at all of us and you'd be like, what in the world is bringing this group together? Okay. Like there was rich people. There was white people. There was black people. There was, you know, white people. There was, there was all these different people. And like, they looked really different. And we all looked very different, but we loved being together. Like we loved hanging out. We loved laughing together. And what brought us together? It was the church. You see, the church brings people together that probably would never connect with each other outside of the church. And that's what's amazing about the church that God wants to build here. Now, it doesn't just stop there because he gives more metaphors that ultimately precede this verse. And we see this in verse 18. He says, for through him, we both have access to the father by one spirit. So Jesus is the cornerstone. He connects us and the Holy Spirit unites us to God, but he also unites us to each other. That's what the Holy Spirit has the ability to do. So every Christian who walks through the doors of a church, we are spiritually bonded as family. So it doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your education level is. We are bonded together and Jesus is building this through the church. Now the church doesn't always execute on this, but it is always capable of this. And that's what we're called to do here at this church is to execute this. And in order to execute what God is writing and what Paul is writing here through the church, it takes commitment. So, so what commitment is, is I just show up when I feel like it. No, no, no. I'm part of God's family. So I show up. I protect Sundays. Like I make the house of God a spiritual priority in my life because this isn't just something I attend. No, no, no. This is a family that I belong to. You see what it continues to write on. It's Hebrews chapter three, verse 13 says, but encourage one another daily. You can't encourage someone you never see. In Hebrews 10, it says, don't neglect the meeting together of the saints. So here's what I'm going to encourage and challenge some of you with. Hey, protect Sunday mornings. Protect it, protect it, protect it. Come on, some of you, I just like feel the Holy Spirit telling me to tell some of you. So don't, you don't get mad at me, okay? Some of us, like we are so focused with our high school students and our middle school students on all the other extracurricular activities. I'm telling you. Your kid has a 0.001% chance of becoming a pro athlete. They have a 100% chance of standing before God one day. Okay? So I just want to tell you, like, they can do these things. There's nothing wrong with those. But I just want to tell you, the most important thing you can steward in your children is a relationship with God. The most important thing you can do with your family is to disciple them to follow Jesus. That's the most important thing. 
So, so you can't encourage someone you don't see. Sundays ought to be protected, but Sundays, it doesn't just stop there. No, 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 no. You seek relationship within the church, okay? The church is not something you just attend for an hour and then leave, okay? So I'm gonna encourage some of you, like the church isn't something I just heard a, the best message you've ever heard, right? Okay, that's what you're gonna say, okay? Um, and then you walk out and you go to your car and then you leave. That's not the church. Like the church is, let's be a church who lingers, okay? Like it's not, I just, I'm got to get done with church because then after this, I got to go to Costco and then I got to go do this and I got to, no, 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 no. Hey, the church is a place where you seek relationship. So right after the service, you're not running on to the next thing. You're, you're finding people you can engage with. To seek relationship is to have conversations. Even if you're like, hey, I'm an introvert and I don't really like to talk to anybody. Can I just challenge everybody here? Man, what, what would it look like for our church if everybody here met one new person a week? I'm not even asking for two, Okay. One new person that you, when you walk up to church and you walk inside the doors, you're engaging with people to create an environment where people can experience the presence of God and know God's people. We, we don't run onto the next thing. No, no, we want to connect here. Like build God's kingdom, build his church because God is calling us to this. We're not worrying about what's next. In fact, here at our church, one of the things we do is we have this thing called Find Your Place of Purpose. We did one last week. We'll be doing another one in August. We want to help you get connected within the body of Christ. So that could be through serving. Um, that could be uh, part of a group. But it's like we're coming together understanding that God has called us to do this. So if you're part of Purpose Church, we want to help you get plugged in and start serving. If you're like, where do you want us to serve? Kids ministry is always a need. Band, musicians, always a need. Set up and tear down starting next week, always a need. When you start serving, you engage with other people and we understand, hey, we're building something special here because God calls us to build his church. So um, be uh, as we continue to think through the church and what God's calling us to do, just understand the greatest thing you're doing for the kingdom of God is your relationship with God and ultimately how you love people through that. So take your first step. Uh, next, uh, ultimately what we see through this pastor, Tim Keller quote, let's go to our, our next one here is that you're going to see through the church that there's a supernatural community through spiritual heart surgery. Okay. Here's what this means. God is transforming hearts. God transforms hearts. How does he do that? Well, it says in verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations. Jesus is our peace and he tears down division. Now, if you're reading this verse and you're not into the Bible, you're probably like, what is he talking about here? Why is he destroying a barrier? What is the dividing wall of hostility that he's talking about? Paul is writing to a group of people that are the Jews and the Gentiles, okay? And the Jews and the Gentiles did not like each other. The Jews were viewed as the chosen people, and the Gentiles were viewed by the Jews as second-class citizens. And that's not what Paul was looking to do. In fact, he continues and he says, his purpose, Jesus' purpose, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death hostility. What was the goal of Jesus? The goal of Jesus was to say there should be no division within the church anymore. And Jesus' fulfillment of this was through the law. You see, what was the dividing wall between the Jews and the Gentiles was the law. Okay? Jews loved the law because the law was given to them by God. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Now, the law was not a bad thing. God gave the Jews the law as an example. This is ultimately what he wanted to to happen. The Jews would be given the law, they would follow the law, and since they were obeying and being obedient to God, they would live in such a way where their community thrived, where their marriages thrived, where their society thrived. This should be the church. You see, when we follow what Jesus says, we will thrive. doesn't mean circumstances are always perfect, but we thrive in the midst of whatever we're facing. The problem was the Jews did not obey the law. They did not follow what God had for them. And what the Jews did is they placed the law above God and the Jews would look down as the gen- at the Gentiles as inferior. That was never the point. Now, this is so important. Why is this important for the church? The Jews, their, the law was their pride and joy. But it divided them from others. So how does this apply to the current church today? Here's what will happen in the church and what will happen with you individually. Your heart will take the best things about you. 
Take a moment. Take three, four, five seconds. Like, what's your greatest accomplishment? Like, what's the thing that like gets you excited that you're so proud of? Okay. Think about that. If you're not careful, the very thing that you're proud of will become the very thing that divides you from others. Okay. So our hearts take the best things and it becomes a way that we look down on others if we're not careful. In fact, here's what um, C.S. Lewis said. He says, uh, people aren't proud of being rich. They're proud of being richer than others. People aren't proud of being beautiful. They're proud of being more beautiful than others. So I want you to imagine for a moment, okay? Um, imagine you are the best pickleball player ever, okay? In, in your town. And you grew up in Beaver Valley, Arizona. I had to look that up. Has anybody ever heard of Beaver Valley, Arizona? Okay, we have one person because why? I think it's the smallest town in Arizona. There's 232 people who live there, okay? So you grew up in Beaver Valley, Arizona, and you were the best pickleball player ever, okay? And your identity was being the best pickleball player in Beaver Valley, Arizona with 232 people. Then you move to Phoenix, and you start going to the pickleball courts, and you start getting killed by other people, including your pastor, because I'll beat you, all right? But it completely destroys you. Why? Your identity was, I am the best pickleball player in town. But then when you move to another town and you started losing, it destroys you. Now, I know that's a funny example, and maybe your, your identity is not being in a, in a pickleball player. But we all place our identity in something. And when we place our identity in something and it's above God, it will bother us so much when other people are better at it than we are. Or we will look down at others when we're better than they are. In fact, we see this in politics all the time. The reason we see this in politics is because politics can become your identity. In fact, some of you, your identity is more in being in politics in the political party that you follow than actually being a Christian. In fact, if, if someone looked at you and you're a Republican and they called you a Democrat, you would be more offended by them that than someone saying you're a non-Christian, even though you're a Christian. It's like, hey, what is your identity in? Some of you, maybe your identity is being in hardworking. I'm hardworking. I'm hardworking. I'm hardworking. So what do you do? You can look down at people who are lazy or I'm punctual. I'm timely. You look down at people who are late. If you're not careful, the best aspects about you have the ability to divide you from other people. So what Paul is saying is what was dividing the Jews and the Gentiles, what was dividing unity within the church was the law and the way they viewed the law. The problem was everyone needs the gospel because no one could keep up the law. The Jews couldn't do it. The Gentiles couldn't do it. Everybody needs the good news of Jesus, and none of you can do it either. That we all need the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and this is why it says this. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. Gentiles were viewed as far from God. The Jews looked at the Gentiles and said, they need God. And the Jews were perceived as close. Some of you, you've been going to your church or church the, your entire life. And there's certain people you see on the television or you see people at work or at your school. And you look at them and you're like, man, they need God. They need God. Yet you've been coming to church your whole life. And God's looking down and saying, you need me. <laughs> they don't just need me. You need me. Why? Because you never graduate from Jesus. You never graduate from the gospel. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people will say, we got to go deeper than the gospel. Like we know this stuff. We know this stuff about Jesus. Anybody who says that doesn't have an understanding of what the scriptures are all about. This whole word is about Jesus. And one of the biggest focuses and understanding that you're actually spiritually mature is knowing that you don't know it all. In fact, some of you, the reason you can know you're spiritually immature today is because you feel like you don't need more of the gospel. You're like, I don't need any more of Jesus. I got enough of Jesus. No, spiritual maturity says, I need Jesus every moment of every single day. Like I need his grace. I need his goodness. I need his faithfulness. I need him every day. Verse 16 says, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Both needed Jesus. Now, how did this involve identity? The Jews propped themselves up because of the law that they were given. How does this involve you or how can this involve our church? All of us have an identity complex. There's something in your life that you want to place above God. It could be your wealth. 
It could be your education. It could be your parenting. It could be your serving. And again, none of those things are bad. But if we're not careful, we become like the people in Luke 18, where it says this. In Luke 18, it says, um, basically, there's someone talking and he's saying, at least I'm not a tax collector. It says, and, and if you don't know anything about a tax collector, they were like the low of the low. And essentially what he's saying is like, hey, I may not be the greatest in the world, but at least I'm not a tax collector. How often do we do that? Like, hey, hey, I know I'm not like the greatest Christian in the world, or I'm not like maybe the closest to God in the world, but man, thank God I didn't vote for that person. Thank God I didn't, you know, I'm not sleeping around with a bunch of people. Thank God, you know, like I smoke a little bit, but not too much. Like, thank God I'm not one of those people who root for Ohio State. <laughs> this is your first time. I'm a Michigan fan every week. It's going to happen. So you should have saw that coming. Now, what this comes down to is that when your identity is something in your life that, that you're placing above God, ultimately what you're saying is this is the most important thing. And when your identity becomes church or religion or just trying to prove yourself to God, what you're saying is, God, since I'm doing these things, you have to bless me. But here's the problem with that line of thinking is that God is not just focused on blessing you because you do good things for him. God wants more of himself for you. And just because you're at church doesn't mean you're actually close to God. Like some of you, you've been coming to church and you're hiding in plain sight. You show up every single Sunday, but you still haven't grown closer to God. You think this is about your performance and your own behavior, and it's not. It's about God and his grace. Some of you, you are just as lost as the people you say who are lost, even though you come to church. Coming to church is great, but the gospel says that no one is better than another. And we thank God for Jesus, because in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was treated the way that we deserved so that God would treat us the way Jesus deserved. You see, you were sinful, but Jesus was placed upon a cross, and we didn't have to. So that means every single person who's in this room, you're not perfect. You can't get to God through your own behavior. It is only through the grace of God that you can be saved. And when God does that, what's amazing is it says, His righteousness is now your righteousness. Like, like when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. And you know what? One of the greatest ways and one of the greatest symbolisms we see of this, it's through baptism. When you get baptized and you stand up out of the water, that represents your old life. When you go up under the water and you come out, that represents your new life. Unfortunately, many people don't understand the importance of baptism or um, they don't understand the theology behind baptism. I'll talk to some people and they say, I just, I don't think I should get baptized yet because I got some stuff I got to figure out in my own life. If that's you today, I just want to tell you that is not from God. That is literally a lie from Satan. Why? Baptism is not about you getting your life together because you never could. Baptism is about what Jesus did for you. If anything in your life, if, if someone asks you, why are you saved? Why is God saving you? And anything starts with anything you've done, you're wrong. It's about what Jesus has done. So when you come up out of the water, that represents your new life. And what you're doing, you're saying, God saved me. Jesus saved me. His grace is sufficient for me. His love is good enough for me. So if you've never taken that next step of baptism, I'm going to encourage you. August 18th, we're going to have a baptism service. And if you've made a decision to follow Jesus and you haven't taken that step, man, it is time to take that step. And if you're thinking, man, I got to pray about it. I got, no, no, no. You don't have to pray about it. There's certain things. I say pray about everything. There's certain things you don't have to pray about. You know what are things that you don't have to pray about? Things that God tell you to do. He already told you through his word, take this step. And what you understand when you get baptized is that this new life is not achieved. It is ultimately received. And you know what happens? That all other identities that you're trying to achieve, they get demoted. I had met with a guy when I was at my last church. This dude, influenced in the community, made a lot of money, had a great job. And I sat down with him and we're talking. And he's giving me great nuggets about business and life and leadership and all these different things. And we get towards the end of the conversation. And I ask him, I said, do you like your job? He was a financial planner. He's like, honestly, not really. I was like, okay. I was like, what, what would you do if you didn't do this? 
He said, you know what? My dream is one day I would become the president of the United States. And I said, why? Like the power? Like, what is it? He said, no, it's so that I could look at everybody who doubted me and I could tell them I'm enough. I left that meeting that day and I just thought, man, he's got some daddy issues. But I also thought, how often am I like that? Like, how often am I trying to achieve something that God's like, I've already given you what you need. Like, I've already given you an identity that's far greater than anything you could achieve in this world. How many of you are pursuing something that is not a bad thing in and of itself, but you're pursuing it because you're focused on what other people think about you? You're focused on what your parents will think about you. You're focused on what your friends will say about you. Like, you're trying to achieve some standard of wealth, promotion, title, and what God wants to look at you and say, hey, all of those things are fine, but your identity is not in those things. Your identity is in me. So can I ask you today, what's your identity in today? What's it in? My greatest identity is not being a pastor. It's not being a father. It's not being a husband. Any of those things can change in a second. My greatest identity is being a child of God. That's it. My identity is in Christ. My identity is not in how great I preach. My identity is not how big our church gets. My identity is not how awesome I am as a parent, although I want to be a great parent. The greatest gift I give this church is my relationship with God. The greatest gift I give my spouse is my identity is in Christ. The greatest gift I give my kids is my identity is in Him. So parents, where's your identity today? Because your kids are going to feel it. Is it in your job? Is it in your wealth? Is it in your education? Or is your identity in Christ? That's the greatest gift you're going to give your kids and the people around you. Lastly, uh, we're going to experience spiritual heart surgery, and we're going to experience it, and then ultimately that's going to play itself out in the world. You see, when it comes to our relationship with God, when it comes to Jesus, there should be incredible unity within the church. If there's division within the church, the outside society sees it. And when the society sees it, you know what happens? They look in and say, I don't want to be part of that. Division happens when we view people as inferior or superior. And in a divided world that we live in right now, you know what it needs? It needs a united church. A divided world needs a united church. Now, how do we do that? How do we become a united church in the midst of a divided world? I mean, that's a tough question um, because you probably don't see it often. Here's how you do it. When you're part of the church, you seek friendship. You seek relationship. You seek to understand people who may not have the same background as you. Like when you leave today, you seek out opportunities to go out on double dates with other couples. You seek friendships. You find a group. You get plugged in serving. And you understand that this church is a place that's being built upon Jesus. And we're building it together. We pray together. We love each other. We help keep each other accountable. We keep showing up even at times when we don't even necessarily feel like it. And we say, you know what happens? I'm going to be here. I'm going to show up. I'm going to love Jesus in the midst of it. So that's what happens inside of the church. But what does it look like inside of the church? It says, he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Outside of the church, how are we called to live? We're called to be peacemakers. Peacemakers don't mean that you fold on what you believe. Peacemakers doesn't mean that you don't share truth. But you seek to honor. You seek uh, to honor people even when you don't understand what they're going through or you understand the point of view that they're coming from. You don't gossip. You don't slander people in your workplace. No, no, no. You celebrate others. You pray for others. You, you pray for those who persecute you. In Scripture, it says you bless those who curse you. I would ask you, do you think that describes the church today? Like as people say, you know what? Hey, like we're going to love Jesus and we're going to stand for truth. Absolutely. We're going to open up God's word and we're going to share it. But in the midst of it, we understand that when we share God's word and we share his truth, there's going to be people who don't like, don't like it. But even when they curse us, we're going to pray for them. We're going to bless them. We're going to love people even when they don't feel the same way that we feel about certain things. And if we do this, what happens is other people notice. And we want them to experience that same peace. In fact, the goal, one of the goals of our church is that people would experience a peace and a presence of God that goes above any type of understanding. Like, could you imagine what it would look like for a valley? 
where people woke up every single day and they experienced the peace of God. That they understood that God loved them, wanted to be in a relationship with them, that they're accepted through Christ. That's what we're trying to build. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to be starting a new series in August. We're going to be doing 21 days of prayer. And we're going to do a series specifically on prayer and revival. Revival is when God does more in a year than he would have done in a decade. He does more in a day than he would have done in a month. And we're calling upon the Lord to do exactly that through our church in this valley because our valley needs it. So here's what I'm asking you. Be here. Commit to being part of the church, building God's church. And not only that, be praying about who are the people that you can invite to church. Be praying about the people who you're called to disciple. And we're going to give you opportunities as a church to give great opportunities for you to be able to do that. So in three weeks, we have free t-shirt Sunday. It's going to be on Sunday, August 11th. We're going to pass out t-shirts for everybody in attendance. And here's what I'm encouraging. Don't come alone. Bring somebody. Who are you praying for? Who are you inviting? Because the gospel will be spoken, the word will be opened, and God will work. And our prayer is that God would do something special. So what's your identity in? Is it in God or is it in something else? And if it's not in God, it's time to place it there. In fact, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus today, that is your first step. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Let's pray. God, I thank you for every person in this room. Lord, I pray for every person who's never made a decision to follow you today. God, I pray that you would um, just open their eyes today. And in fact, if you haven't made a decision, but you want to make a decision to follow Jesus today, it's as simple as telling God, I'm sorry for my sin and I want to follow you. I'm surrendering my life to you and I want to know you today, God. For everybody else, Lord, I pray that you help us experience your presence in these next couple of moments and that you teach and comfort and guide and encourage us wherever we need to be encouraged and guide us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Jess. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. We're so glad to have you. And hey, if you made a first-time decision to follow Jesus today, we are so excited for you. It is the best decision that you will ever make. I want to encourage you to go to our website, purposearizona.com slash connect card, and you'll see a connect card on the website. Go ahead and fill that out. It gives us a little bit of information about you and helps us come alongside you and support you as you start this journey. Also, if you just want to connect with our church or if you want to invest financially in what God is doing here in the Valley, all of the information is on the website, purposearizona.com. And lastly, we meet in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. at Desert Edge High School, and we'd love for you to join us. Be sure to follow us on social media for any other updates. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.